Right. Welcome everybody to the fun office hours again, uh, November 7th, 2023. So today, a couple of things on the agenda. Uh, I'm going to give a report on what's new in Fortran 2023 and what is the committee working on for the next edition of the standard, which is right now codenamed uh, 2020Y. Um, and then we'll try and brainstorm and talk a little bit about when and what do we want to do for the next fun training session. Uh, the last one I thought went really well, was successful, and a lot of people seem to enjoy it, so we'd like to do another one. And so we're brainstorming ideas for uh, what would you all like to learn about in terms of modern Fortran. Uh, so. Let me share my screen and we'll start with the new editions of the standard. Slideshow. All right, so Fortran 2023 and Fortran 2020Y. So Fortran 2023 is in publication. It's been submitted to the International Standards Organization for publication as the next revision of the standard. They just haven't gone through whatever paperwork process is necessary to get it officially published. Um, but we, we have finalized what the content will be. So, um, like I said, exact date to be determined, but it's been submitted. So. Um, as is almost always the case, there is an interpretation document. This is the version of the standard that the committee works from. Not, it will be the same in content as what is published from ISO, um, but you can get it freely from the J3 website. So there's a link there. Uh, a more comprehensive description of the things I'm going to show can be found in a paper that Usually John Reed, who is a, who used to be a uh, convener or editor of the standard, uh, but uh, he, he always writes the, a paper that is kind of descriptions of like, hey, what's new in the next version of the standard? And so his paper on the WG5 website, uh, you can find, and it's got more, more description and more detail about uh, some of the things I'll cover. So, uh, start off, here's just the high level list of the things, the new key features of Fortran 2023. Uh, one of the, one of the big ones is line length and statement length limits. For, if, for all intents and purposes are being eliminated, uh, the, the limits are set to something high enough that nobody would bother. Hopefully nobody would bother implementing it as this hard limit and that it's just unlimited now. Um, so shouldn't have to worry about how long your lines get and how many continuation lines you use and how to how long your statements end up to being in total uh, going forward as soon, as soon as the compilers implement this. Um, there's a bunch of additional intrinsic procedures being added. Uh, the first couple, split and tokenize, are string related. So split lets you uh, divide a string up into several strings based on some separator character. Uh, tokenize does something similar, um, but it, they work in slightly different ways. Again, the details you can go find in the next version of the standard or the description document that I mentioned. Um, there's a whole bunch of trigonometric functions uh, that are being added that work in terms of degrees or in terms of multiples of pi, whereas the, the existing ones all work in terms of radians. Uh, and then selected logical kind to mirror selected real kind or selected integer kind. Um, and then a couple of IEEE functions that do maximum, minimum, and then maximum and minimum magnitude. Uh, ISO Fortran ENV, there's a few new kind constants being added, uh, all the ones for logical, and then a smaller real kind. Uh, ISO C binding, there's a couple of functions being added to work with strings, 
do, to do C interoperability with strings a little bit more conveniently. And then the rest of these, I'm gonna go into detail a little bit more on following slides, uh, but automatic re reallocation of strings, type of and class of, these ones are gonna be, are kind of interesting. Conditional expressions and arguments, these ones are a little bit interesting. Put with notify, simple procedures, rank agnostic array indexing and bound specification, do concurrent reduction specifiers, and then enumeration and enum types. So automatic reallocation of strings. So this first block um, was something that already worked as of uh, 2008, I believe. Uh, deferred length allocatable characters, so you can just do uh, intrinsic allocation on assignment, and you know the, the string gets the length of the thing on the right hand side. In an effort to make this uh, to th make things more consistent in places where a lot of intrinsic procedures and things used to kind of hand wave as and say as if by intrinsic assignment. So like uh, get command or um, there, there's an optional error message argument to, to some intrinsics uh, and, and then also in write statements uh, doing, write, doing uh, internal file IO like writing to a string. Uh, a lot of those places would kind of say as if by intrinsic assignment, but the string already had to be allocated and it didn't actually change its size. For allocatable characters, intrinsic assignment does change its size. And so what they did was they said, well, you can pass an allocatable, if you pass an allocatable character, it will get reallocated if necessary, but allocated to the right size of the th string that is going to be produced. So, so these things will work now. Next, type of and class of. So, uh, these are ways of saying that a variable has the same type or class as another variable. Uh, this is kind of coming with an eye towards some of the upcoming uh, generic features. Uh, so you can do something like integer x and then say type of x uh, for y, and so y just has the same type as x. So in this case, an integer. Or you can do the same thing for polymorphic variables, so you can say class something for one variable and then you say class of that variable for for declaring another one and it says oh the, the declared types are the same it does not mean that these are not runtime things though so uh, so you can't say uh, i've got some argument that is class star for example unlimited polymorphic and then say type of that variable and expect that it gets the right type at runtime. It doesn't work that way. So you can't say you can't say type of A if A is declared as class star or class or class anything that is abstract because we can't have a variable that is uh, of declared a that is of a type that is abstract. And feel free to stop me at any point if you have questions or want some clarification on any of this. Just yeah, quick question here. So it sounds like type of is more like auto in C++ rather than type of. Yeah, a little bit. So this is just to make it easier to write code, but not actually functional in any way. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later when we get into some of the things that are coming in 2020 Y. Um, and, and this is kind of helpful in the, um, the poor man's way of writing template or generic code that we have now, where you can use an include statement to like grab Fortran code from some other file. So you could like write the interfaces and declarations and then say, include the actual code from the other place. Now you can actually declare local variables that say type of whatever's going to be you know, declared on the outside. Um, so you could write generic code, right? So you just write the interface multiple times, but you don't have to write the actual code multiple times. And so you can say type of X, 
where X is one of the arguments that is going to have a different type depending on which procedure I'm in. But it, the, you, this also comes in handy with some of the upcoming features. Um, any other questions before I move on? Okay. Uh, conditional expressions. So the Fortran language does not do short circuiting of logical expressions. So it, every, every, if you want to say, you know, uh, something and something else, it, it evaluates all of them, even if it wouldn't necessarily have to. And so you would see, you would occasionally see people write something along the lines of if I is less than the size of some array and that ele and the ith element in that array has some condition, but that is that is actually not standards conforming because if I is not or if I is greater than the size of that array, it will still index into that array to evaluate the second part of that expression. With um, conditional expressions, we now have a syntax to do short circuiting of logical expressions. Um, this syntax is borrowed straight from C uh, with the extra parentheses required around it. But what this says is that the, the, con the code in the condition that is used is the only one that is evaluated. So if size of A is, or if I is less than the size of A, it will evaluate this expression. Otherwise, it won't even evaluate this expression. It's just going to take, evaluate the other expression. So you can so you can end up doing that. That make sure that I'm in, that I'm within my array bounds and that whatever other condition is true, you can do those in one if statement. Whereas before you had to separate them because it was going to evaluate the second one even even though you didn't want it to. So this is a little bit of simplification. There's an there's a sister feature that has come along with this called conditional arguments, uh, where we can use this syntax. And for optional arguments, you do not need the, the alternative expression. So, um, so if you've ever, I mean, this is not a style that I use very often, but if you've ever done this where you've got optional arguments and you've got things that you want to check to determine which ones you want to pass, when you're going to call some procedure, you'd end up, especially if there was more than one, you could end up with this, you know, nested, you know, combinatorial explosion of like, well, if this, then I call it with these arguments, else I call it with these arguments, but I got to repeat that check over here because if the other one's not present, right? Um, so now you can use that in this inline uh, conditional argument syntax to optionally pass the different arguments in a single procedure call. Uh, put with notify. This is effectively a shorthand for something that was fairly common using, and you could accomplish with events, but kind of lets you put that into a single statement now, where you can say, I'm going to assign to some, to some variable on another image. I want to also have something that notifies that image that I've done so when it arrives. So you used to have to do use events and manually do an event post after the assignment to make sure that you could uh, that the other image could wait until that assignment had been completed. But now you can do it with a, a notify variable. But it, it it's effectively a similar pattern, just a just a little shorter. Uh, simple procedures. Uh, these are coming in with the same rules as pure, but you also can't reference host or use associated variables. So with pure procedures, you were still allowed, to, you weren't allowed to change the value of any use or host associated variables, but you could reference them. The, the simple designation says that you can't do that either. So basically, the only things you can look at in a simple procedure are its arguments. Sorry, uh, can I ask a more specific question here? Huh? I always wonder, what's the advantage of uh, declaring subroutine as pure or function? 
Uh, so Duke and Current had the rule that you could only call pure procedures inside. Oh, uh, okay. I see. Uh, and that has to, to do with uh, optimizations that the compiler can make. It, uh -huh. if, if I know that you're not changing the values of anything that this is going to be referencing behind my back, I can do, I can potentially do the whole thing in parallel. Like I can spawn a whole bunch of threads and do it all in parallel or offload it to a GPU, which Intel and Nvidia have picked up on and actually implemented. Ah, oh, okay. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> so simple gives you that even, even yeah. more extra guarantee that, well, it's not even referencing anything other than its arguments. So I know exactly what it's going to be looking at. There are even more optimizations that I can do. Oh, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. It may come in, this one may come into effect when we get to asynchronous tasks, which I'll talk about for 2020 Y. Okay. Um, rank agnostic. Sorry, or rank Brad. Yeah. Sorry, could I just say something else on that last part is that um, it also, if you mark something as pure or simple, it also allows the compiler to check you to make sure that you don't break the rules. So for example, if you're writing a procedure where you know that your intent is to not um, to not access, if we're talking about simple, to not access anything outside of it, and then you accidentally do a typo or somebody else is editing the code and add something in where it violates that original intent, then the compiler can you know, obviously prevent compilation from happening. So that's also another thing that's um, helpful with using these types of keywords. Yep. Oh, got it. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Uh, so rank agnostic arrays with an eye towards writing, like I said, we're going to, we're thinking about uh, generic procedures and generic code, ways of writing generic code for the next standard. Um, one of those things has to do with things that are agnostic about the rank of an array. Uh, and so we've got some syntax now that allows us to talk about and reference arrays in a rank agnostic way. Um, so, so far, these are still just compile time. Like you, uh, you still can't use these without a select rank. So like if you, we, we got assumed rank in 2018 which said, I can say, uh, this is going to be an array, but it could be any rank, uh, including scalar. But you still had to use select rank to actually refer to that thing. So you would know, so that the compiler would know the rank. You still need that, but at least the code, at least subsections of the code won't need to know the rank. So like I was saying, where you could use the include trick, this gives you a way to kind of do that as well. So. You can use and array, a one-dimensional array to declare the bounds or shape of, of an array. And so the, the syntax here doesn't explicitly tell you what the rank of it is. You have to go look at well, what's the size of the array. So this is going to be a 2D array with shape 3, 4. And then you can use the at notation for indexing and that will allow you to index into two, three, the length and the rank have to match. So there's also, um, you can actually kind of chain these together. So if, if a IDX is not as long as the rank of a, you can say at IDX comma and provide the rest of them. And you can even combine them in multiple ways. So you can get kind of fancy with it, but we haven't seen, I don't know what the use cases are for doing anything much more fancy than this, but the syntax is allowed at least. And Brad, do, do, do these need to be known at compile time? The values do not, but the, the size I think does. Right. So. So you can't use an allocatable array to define the bounds. Although I may have to go double check on that a little bit. There's some and there's some situations where it doesn't need to be known at compile time, but I have to check on some of those. But 
but the values definitely don't need to be known at compile time. Um, do concurrent reductions. So we get a, a new specifier for do concurrence, which um, before this, it was actually invalid to define or redefine a variable in more than one iteration of a do concurrent block. So this code would technically have been invalid, but the rules around what, what it means when you say reduce. Um, so you're going to say, I'm going to be doing a summation on S. So now you can, we can do this and it still, and then this allows it to like know that I can still do this in parallel, but there's something special I have to I have to do to take care of it when I'm done. For example, S needs to be initialized to zero for every iteration, and then it can do a parallel reduction on those. So this is how you can write um, reductions. And I think it's, I think uh, plus, star, max, and min are the allowed ones for now. And then those are the ones you're, those are the operations you're allowed to perform on that variable. And you can do whole lists of them and, and all of that. Enum and enumeration types. So uh, we had enum bind C before, but now we're allowed to specify that it is its own type. Um, so enumerations are ways of declaring constants where there's like, or saying there is a set of these values that I would like to be able to refer to, but it's, it's a limited set. Like I really only want people to use these ones. Um, for the, the enums were brought into the language with the uh, C interoperability features so that you could, because C had a similar construct where you could say enum and you know specify a list of constants and give them, they, they, the C language specifically says that they're integers. Um, we're trying to add a little bit of type safety to that to say, so that you can say, no, it, it's not just an integer. I specifically want an integer that is from this set of values. So, so we're adding a little bit of type safety to the existing enum uh, construct. Um, it's a little bit of type safety. It's not a lot because you're still allowed to do things like uh, work on them as if they're integers and you can still use an integer value, an integer literal or an integer variable in places where it, it does say that you want to type season. Uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, and also we're getting a new, t a new construct that is enumeration type. And these really are a lot more type safe. Um, you cannot pass a, you can't just pass an integer to something that is of type color, but you can use them in select case statements. Uh, and there's a little bit of extra stuff that you can do with them. But for the most part, it's like, hey, I want to define what are the allowed colors or you know something along those lines. Uh, here's the set of allowed valuables for variables of this type. And you can't just, you know, say that, oh, I want the color 32, because that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. All right. So that covers most of the stuff that's new in 2023. Uh, now we can talk a little bit about what the committee is planning for the next edition of the standard, which for now we're calling 2020Y. Um, on average, we've been getting about a standard, a new version of the standard every five years. So we're kind of hoping to hit the 2028 timeframe, but we haven't made enough progress to really have any, have any guarantees there. So um, we have a preliminary list of items that has confirmed that we're going to work on them uh, and we voted on that in June of this year. Uh, we got a couple of more, a few more items added to that list in this recent meeting, the October meeting. And there's a possibility to add some more in the February and June meetings next year. 
but for the most part, this is probably the majority of the list of things that will be worked on. Um, you can go see the official list that we voted on in June at the WG5 website with this link. Um, then there, these are the papers for the additional things that we're going to be adding to that list that were passed at the October meeting. Um, so what are those work items? Uh, the first one is a proposal from the Japanese Fortran working group uh, that they, they proposed a way of making generic subprograms, and uh, you can go read their paper that's it's referenced on the WG5 site um, to kind of get some more of the details, but I'll, I'll talk briefly about what that looks like. Um, so everything that I've marked with a star here, I'm going to talk about in a future slide. Um, make default implicit typing obsolete. Uh, make the D format descriptor obsolete. So if you've got format specifiers that use the D edit descriptor, I believe that was specifically for double precision values. If I recall, I'd have to go look it up, but um, we're just going to get rid of that one and just have the, the floating point edit descriptor or the general edit descriptor that'll work for, for any real kind. Um, there's a, a, a desire to add this note that the real model is not the IEEE 754 model. They're similar, but not the same. And there are some subtleties about cases where this is what the Fortran standard says, and this is what the IEEE standard says, and they don't necessarily agree exactly. So in cases where the Fortran standard deviates from IEEE, like we, we want to be clear that, yeah, that's because we're not promising to be exactly IEEE. Um, we're going to add asynchronous tasks, C interoperability for new interchange floating point types in C. Um, so basically, this is just expanding the list of the kind values that are corresponding to the C types. So there was a few new C types added, so we're going to add, add those to the list. Uh, provide a mechanism to specify global binding name for non-C interoperable. So when you say bind C for a procedure or a variable or a couple of other things, you can say what the name of that thing is on the C side, because number one, Fortran is not case specific. Uh, case sensitive. And number two, there's no real strict requirement that you name them exactly the same thing. Um, but uh, it has been expressed that there's a desire to be able to say something like that on the Fortran side of like, uh, the, the use case really is like external procedures. So if I want to say, or, um, yeah, mod or module procedures that are like from some other shared library, I want, to, I want to be able to say, uh, no, I want to give it this name so at link time it knows what name to look up, and I want to be able to say that on both sides to make sure that the names line up. So when I do dynamic linking or, or what have you, the, the linker will know what names to use. Uh, improve rank independent functionality. Um, so we want to start extending some of the intrinsics maybe and potentially start working on some things for like rank agnostic loops like rather than have a trusted triply nested loop well what if i don't know what the rank is going to be i still want to be able to loop over the elements of some array um, we want to work on some mechanisms for actually using deferred rank things without needing the select rank construct in all cases um, improve polymorphic pure function results. I'll talk about that one a little bit. Allow IO on enumeration type values. Um, so the new enumeration types uh, aren't currently allowed in IO directly as IO values. Um, we're gonna work on how we wanna handle that when you're doing reads and writes on variables of those types. Uh, add a Fortran friendly preprocessor. I'll briefly mention that provide intrinsics for source location. I'll briefly mention that. Add maximum rank co-rank constants to ISO Fortran ENV. Uh, so I think the way the standard says it now is a processor must support a up to a total of 15 for the rank and co-rank of a variable. So you can't have like a rank 15 array that then has a co-rank, like is a co-array and has a co-rank of of anything actually at that point, right? So 
uh, the total of the rank and the co-rank, the, the only requirement is that be 15. So uh, we're going to add a constant so you can kind of somewhat semi inquire about well what is the maximum rank or co rank that is supported by the processor that I'm compiling with. I have namespace like access to modules and enumeration values I'll talk about that for a minute Add support for describing the target of a pointer as immutable so if you say intent in for a pointer argument. That means you can't change what that name points to, but you can change the thing it points at. So if I have like an integer pointer intent in argument x, I can still say x equals something. I just can't say x arrow something. Uh, and so we want a way to say the second half of that, which is, no, I'm not going to change what it points to, and I'm not going to change the thing it points at. Uh, define default kind values to use. Oh, this is going to be an interesting one. Add generic programming templates. Um, so I have given a handful of presentations on the templates that the generic subgroup has been working on. Um, so I won't go into more detail on that in this presentation. Um, and then the, the three papers passed this last meeting, usable polymorphism and co-arrays. Uh, IEEE 754 math functions, and then scan and co-scan. So let's start going through some of those items. Let me see. Is that from the chat? Let me open the chat up. Thanks, have to. Okay. Allow generic subprograms. So allows duplicated procedures for multiple types kinds to be combined. So if in the case that you have identical code for different kinds of integer, um, this is kind of the shorthand for, I want exactly the same thing for every kind of integer. Uh, basically, it's going to allow you to say, I want this procedure for this list of types and or kinds for each of these arguments. And it will do the Cartesian product of each of those lists. And this is all compile time. This is not runtime. So basically, this generates a function for every integer kind or type or what have you at compile time and they're all referred to with the same name so it's basically using the same existing generic resolution features that we have where you can say generic interface some name and then I have specific procedures that can all be referred to by that name um, they still have to be uh, distinguishable in the same way that that generic resolution still had to be distinguishable when you were going to do it manually. This is just a way of doing a shorthand version of that where all of the implementations are the same. Um, there's potentially going to be some specialization allowed so you can say potentially do select rank or select type on uh, arguments that have multiple types or kinds or what have you. Um, but uh, basically this is going to allow you to shrink the number of implementations that you have to write in order to do, you know, support multiple kinds of something. Uh, make default implicit typing obsolete. So basically this turns implicit none into the default. Um, so if you want implicit typing, you can get it back by saying implicit, implicit real parens a through z, right? And so then, the, but you won't have to repeat implicit none everywhere all the time. That will, that will just be the default. Asynchronous tasks. Um, this is going to give us a way to say that these things are unrelated and you can do them in parallel if you want. So you can say, so, uh, the, the way we're thinking about it so far is to kind of reuse the block construct and add a keyword. So task this block of code. And what that means is that 
you can do this, do the things in this block of code somewhere else at the same time as you do any, anything that follows up until a wait on a handle of some sort. And so, like I said, uh, probably the default, but maybe, maybe um, may, it may be opt in or it may be opt out. Uh, we haven't decided yet, but the things that you call inside of a task block will be simple, right? Because that way I know that I, I really am not even, mod I'm not modifying anything that I can't see from the interfaces of the procedures that I'm calling in that block in such a way that like would affect the execution in parallel right because do unrelated things could change a module variable somewhere that do stuff looks at even if it's pure and that would make it invalid to run those things in parallel but if if do stuff is simple it can't be referring to a module variable that anybody else could modify Uh, polymorphic pure procedure outputs. So up until now, if you had anything that was polymorphic as an output from some procedure, you were not allowed to make it pure. Um, and we'll probably do, we'll probably do both pure and simple or some, something along those lines. And the reason you weren't allowed to make it pure if it was polymorphic was at compile time, the compiler doesn't know if the actual argument might be of a type that has an impure final subroutine. So for example, uh, this derived type C has a final subroutine F that is invoked any time it is passed as an actual argument to something that is intent out, right? Because it gets finalized before it enters into the procedure where it's an argument that's an intent out. Or if you do an assignment to it that might uh, reallocate it. So uh, if it's an allocatable thing, right, it, the compiler doesn't know if some some impure code might end up being called as part of a final subroutine. And so we want to explore a way of saying this type can be used as a polymorphic output because it and none of its child types have an impure final subroutine. Um, and that way you'll be able to say uh, class P intent out or the result of a function and then still make the, that function or subroutine pure or simple. Add a Fortran friendly preprocessor. So it's been a long time coming. Everybody I'm sure on this call has seen the use of the C preprocessor or some variant of it in Fortran code before where the, the committee is exploring ways to standardize that use. So it's probably gonna look very similar to a lot of the C preprocessor code you've seen in use before, because we're doing a broad survey of what is the common usage of this of the preprocessors that are out there. So we can try and break as little code as possible as we you know define a standardized one. But basically it will be something along the lines of conditional compilation, is almost conditional compilation almost certainly will be in there uh, and we'll probably have a couple of other of the common use cases of using a preprocessor uh, another similar kind of thing is to just provide some intrinsics for determining source location i've seen i've seen handfuls of times that people use the c preprocessor with the like double underscore line or double underscore file macro stuck in there um, because it's a common thing to want to do in terms of debugging or producing error messages or stack traces or what have you, um, is to, I want to know where in the source, what, what line and what file in the source code this is going to come from. So we're probably going to provide some intrinsics that look like source file or source line that we can just, you don't have to use the preprocessor to get at those. namespaced scoped access so it has been asked several times now for something along the lines of what other languages have in terms of like uh so python is like one of the quintessential examples of like i can say import foo as bar and then i have to say bar dot 
in order to access any of the procedures or what have you that are inside that module. Um, we're probably going to do it with, you know, the syntax here is preliminary, but uh, the first, first suggestion was to use module name double percent thing in the module to refer to things in a, in a name spaced way. Um, we might also explore ways of saying, I'm going to use this module and I don't want anything to be able to be used from it except in a namespaced way, uh, some things like that. Um, and the other thing is the new enumeration types uh, should just work for referring to the enumerators in this like namespaced way so that you can disambiguate if I've got you know enumerators that use the same thing enumeration types that use the same names for their enumerators, I can disambiguate which one I'm talking about, even if they're both in scope at the same time. Uh, default kind values. So the, this has bitten everyone at least once, I'm sure, that the, the kind of a literal is the default real. And doing an assignment, even in a parameter statement, does not mean that the literal is anything other than default real. And the assignment and this always bites people when they want to do, uh, you know, when they define pi, they define it out to 16 digits and then wonder why their, why their double precision math isn't working correctly because they forgot to use the, the subscript to define the kind of that literal or use the D, the, the D exponent descriptor or what, what have you. Um, this is an alternative way of kind of making it easier to not do, not accidentally do the wrong thing, which is a statement that says in this scope, the default real is this specific kind. So you, your real variables don't need to say what kind they are. They will be whatever you said is the default and your literals don't need to say what kind they are. They'll be whatever the default is. And this will hopefully have people making that mistake less often. Um, usable polymorphism in co-arrays. So there are a handful of constraints in the standard right now that effectively make anything that is polymorphic in a co-array not really usable as if it was in a co-array. They don't say that you can't have polymorphic things in a co-array. It's just that you can't refer to them on anybody else's image if, they're po if there's anything polymorphic about it, which means that you can't actually use it as a co-array. Um, we're going to explore whether or not we can just remove those constraints and use polymorphic things in co-arrays. There's some technical like implementation reasons about why it might be hard or not very performant but we still think it's going to be valuable in certain cases and so we might want to release these relieve these constraints and make the go make the uh make the compiler writers go do the hard things uh ieee 754 uh it was brought to our attention that there were a handful of ieee 754 math operations that are recommended to be supported that fortran doesn't have and so we're exploring adding all of those to to the standard. Um, none of them are very surprising. They just haven't been in the Fortran standard yet. Uh, scan and co-scan. Uh, so we have a reduce and co-reduce that are somewhat analogous, but reduce and co-reduce take a, take an array or a co-array and reduce, reduce it to a scalar value. Scan keeps all the intermediate results, basically. Um, so if you want to do the plus operation as a scan, you know, you get the, the first element in, as the first element, the first element plus the second one as the second element, and then that plus the third one as the third element, etc. And then there's, there's a couple of versions of this, one gets uh, shifted one position to the right. Um, so we're going to explore ways of adding that kind of functionality to the language. So that covers 
what's coming, what's new and what's coming in Fortran 2023 and 2020 Y. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have one question. So from previous versions, how many years does it usually take for a compiler to implement, for example, 23 standard? 2003 was the really hard one for everybody. That's where we introduced polymorphism. Okay. Uh, it took some compilers just stopped. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Several compilers that just stopped and didn't make it to 2003. Um, wow. But there were there was a lot of support by like 2010, 2012. And so then everybody was still kind of playing catch up for 2008. But um, these years, there's a several compilers that are fully 2018 compliant. And um, we, we don't think we added anything that hard. So I don't think it will be very long before there are several 2023 compliant compilers. That's, you know, minus whatever bugs people happen to still be able to find. But, you know, at least in, in theory, they, they can parse the right syntax and, and in the common cases do the right things. So I, I think we'll probably see some compliant compilers in a few years. Okay. I have one more question if you, as other people don't have. But this is more of a curiosity kind of questions about those meetings you guys had for deciding Fortran, you know, standard or adding implementation. I'm curious. So when someone is suggesting new feature like this, uh -huh. do they, for example, modify existing compiler in the way they want? Is that new feature they are targeting that and test and then present at the conference? That and is the way that C++ does it. And we would okay. love to do that, but um, it's been hard to find people who have the, the expertise and time to go modify any of the open source compilers to do that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. the vendors like, like Intel or NVIDIA have so far been unwilling to really do that kind of exploration in their Fortran compilers. Um, I'm very hopeful that L Fortran will start to be that because he, uh, Andre Surtik, who is the lead developer of that compiler. It's not really production ready yet, but they're getting a lot closer pretty, pretty recently. Um, he's been prototyping the templates feature for us. So like, uh, so next week at supercomputing, uh, I'm going to actually give a tutorial where we use the L4 Trend compiler to start demonstrating the use of some of these templates features. So, but so Really, the order of operations at this stage is here's a feature I think we'd like. The subgroup that is responsible for that area of the standard takes a look at it and says, yeah, we think we can do something along those lines uh, and we'll work on that for the next standard and we'll get back to you with what the exact syntax should be, what the exact semantics should be. And then the compilers, if they want to say that they're compliant with the standard, have to go implement it. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, yes. that sometimes there's there's a risk there in standardizing something that's never been done before. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it can't be actually be done. Hopefully, we haven't actually done that, but we would like to be in a position where we're saying no. Uh, before it gets into a new revision of the standard, some compiler needs to go prototype this and make sure that it's possible. Okay. Okay. That's very interesting. <laughs> All right. If there are no other questions, we want to take a few minutes and talk about. Let's see. I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, recently, I tried to uh, take a code and elevate the precision above double precision, like triple or quad. Mm -hmm. And the NVIDIA compiler didn't seem to let me do that. Do you know, are there compilers where you can do that or what? Uh, G4 Fortran supports quad precision. So there's a, there's a real 128 constant, right? Mm -hmm. 
the standard does not say that you must support a real that as a real kind. It's val in, in which case its value should be negative one, right? So that constant must exist for every compiler, but not every compiler must support a real of that kind. <laughs> The, the way they said it, it was kind of weird. Uh, a compiler is only is only required to support two real kinds: the default real, which has a minimum precision decimal precision of like seven decimal places, and a double precision, which has ten, something like that. So, like double precision doesn't even have to be as high as it usually is. Um, or no. What does it say? I, I forget exactly what the language is in the standard. I have to go look it up, but. Uh, so it doesn't say that the default real must be a 32 bit real. And it only says that double precision must have a higher precision. I, th I think that might be as loose as it says it. And so it, double precision is not guaranteed to be 64 bits. It could be something else. Um, and so those, the constants in ISO Fortran ENV, like real 32, real 64, are not guaranteed to correspond to the default real or default double precision. Right? The, the kind system right now is a little mixed up. Um, so yeah, so nobody is actually guaranteed to support quad precision, but I know G Fortran does, I think, I think Intel does. I think NAG does. I think I think there are a few compilers that will support it. Okay. All right. So with the handful of minutes we have left, I would like to talk a little bit about a next fun training event. So the last one was pretty went pretty well, was pretty popular, so uh, I'd like to start brainstorming ideas. Kate had prepared a poll. If if you wouldn't mind sharing the poll, Kate, uh, and we can kind of get a little bit of feedback on what would be a good topic and what would be a good format. Yes. Oh, it says my shared screen can seen can be seen only by hosts and co-hosts. Is that true? Uh, okay. Now I believe everyone can see my screen um, and my internet may be unstable. So I hope that everybody can hear me really quickly. I'd like to advertise um, that there's a boff that both um, Brad and I are in at SC next week. Um, so if anybody is going to be in at SC on Thursday, feel free to come over to this boff. I'll just quickly drop this in chat so that um, people can look at the details later if they so desire. Um, so feel free to go to slido.com and use this number to react to this little poll about future topic. And I believe that we will be able to see it live as it's populated. Um, so as it asks, what topic would you like for the next fun event? And these topics, as it says, have been picked from previous survey data and we'll have a sort of other option on the next poll, although we might need to skip it based on time. But let's see, let me see if there's another, I think also if, if you use this entire link, maybe that, that'll be an easier way to get into the into the Slido. So we'll take some time here to see, to let people respond. We'll train in GPUs. I had a feeling that might be a popular one. Oh, we've got some more and responses. Modernizing the legacy code, C interrupt. And okay. we are at the top of the hour, so I can stay on for a couple more minutes to try and wrap up this poll. But if anybody has to drop off for another meeting, obviously, please feel free. But we'll try to get through some more questions if that's all right. Yeah, and I'll send out uh, the slides that on my presentation, and we can include the links to these. 
Do these stay open for very long, Kate? Can we leave them open for a little while and see if anybody... It's one of those things where, like, the presenter moves from question to question, so okay. um, the entire thing is not available to answer. Okay. But it is possible we can create a separate survey, but you and I can chat about that later. We'll see. All right. Or we can make a decision today. Who knows? <laughs> But okay. It's... G interoperability. Okay. So. So it looks like we have six responses. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've got some more in. Maybe I will stay on this for 30 more seconds and then we'll move on. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we might be able to borrow. There was a uh, NVIDIA put on a GPU hackathon and included a Fortran section. So we can borrow some content from that. And basically they did, uh, they did four different ways of running code on GPU, even with Fortran, which was do concurrent, which is standard in the language, uh, OpenMP offload, OpenACC, and CUDA. Very nice. Oh, we okay. Explain. Sorry to interrupt. I think cool. I will move on to the next question. So thank you everybody who responded. Um, this is an open one. I think I'll leave this open for less time so we can get to the others. But if there's any additional topics that you would like to see for a future event that weren't listed on the past one, feel free to quickly jot that open or sorry, jot that in now. I will leave this one open for maybe just about 45 seconds so we can move on promptly. Interesting. Very cool. Maybe interoperability with other languages. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had thought about maybe just putting Fortran and interoperability, but since C is the only like real interoperability in the standard, um, there that's are how I listed it on the previous question, but there are a few tools out there that make the interoperability with the other languages slightly more convenient than having to manually write the Fortran interface to the C to the thing. But yeah, testing and CI best practices. That might be interesting. Okay. Yeah, these are great suggestions. Okay, I think I will move on. Thank you for those responses. Um, and this is about the mode, um, tutorial, hackathon, or other. And if there's an other, feel free to type it in the chat or unmute yourself and say out loud. Um, Brad, do you want to explain maybe the basic differences between a tutorial well, and a hackathon? Tutorial would be something like, uh, you know, lecture combined with exercises, kind of the way we did the last one. A uh, hackathon is usually bring your own code with some goal in mind related to the topic that we're covering. So like, for example, the GPUs one is like, bring your own code and we'll talk about how to get it to run on a GPU or get some portions of it to run on a GPU or make it parallel with co-arrays or, you know. So if there's some interest in that specific avenue, we can, we can explore that. Yeah, I think mo I think the topics that we have discussed so far in the previous questions, I think they all lead themselves well to tutorials, maybe not all of them, um would make sense as hackathons so maybe keep that in mind when answering but um yeah so i will leave this open for i don't know 30 seconds 45 seconds more. yeah okay. and you can always email us or uh submit to the, the email list any other suggestions or comments as well so yes i encourage everyone to do so if they have any additional ideas they would like us to hear about okay so we've got it seems like from we've got i mean only four responses but it seems like the majority would like a tutorial so now just because this, um, I was only allowed to have a maximum of three, 
<laughs> bear with me and I will switch to a different Slido where we talk about timing. So I'm going to share a new link in the chat if I can get to the right window. So please use that link or go to slido.com and type in that number to respond to the, the this question, which is when. So we kept a little bit broad, sort of we're potentially aiming for the first quarter of next year. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, these are some broad periods of time. And um, if you would like to add a more detailed answer, feel free to drop that in the chat if you want to add some more specifics. And of course, we um, we can only do our best to accommodate all needs, right? So we'll try to we'll try to pick something that works, um, but it's hard to pick something that works perfectly for everyone, of course. And we'll record as necessary as well and, and post it just like we did the last one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I will leave this open for about 45 more seconds. Doesn't seem particularly weighted one way or the other. No. So I guess we get to pick. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, yeah, and again, feel free to email, send a message to the email list with what your preferences would be. Yes. And we'll try to look out for some um, very big name conferences that are likely to be important to um, the Fortran users at NERSC can try to avoid scheduling um, at a similar time. So we'll try to keep aware of things like that. Um, but yes, thank you for everyone's response so far. I think I will move on to the next question and potentially the last one. Um, if I don't remember exactly, but what mode? So the last time we did a two half days. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a question, was that something that people enjoyed that breakdown or is something shorter but more intensive desired? So feel free to answer. Looks like the half days were very popular. Yes, I'm not surprised. That's what I would personally prefer and find more easy to fulfill. So mm -hmm. always good to ask. OK, well, we've got five responses. And All that right. seems like the majority of people in this in the call still. So let me just check. Yeah, that is the last question. So. Thank you so much, everybody, for responding. We appreciate your feedback. And as Brad said, feel free to email the uh, list or email either Brad or myself with any additional suggestions that you would like to share. And let I will stop screen sharing. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, this was another successful office hours. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it.